two times. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, or whatever is the case for uh, the audience. Um, I'm Radu Marculescu from University of Texas at Austin, and uh, I have the great honor to um, moderate this panel today. So it's NOx 15 plus plus is an, an anniversary panel for 15 plus years of NOx. Um, for those of you who were in uh, Bill's uh, keynote in the morning, you may have noticed that he was mentioning 21 years the reason of Knox. The reason is that his research was earlier than the actual start of the uh, Knox. So Knox started with some workshops first, and then uh, it became a, a symposium as it is now in 2007. That was the first edition. So that's the reason for 15. And the reason for plus plus is obviously we're looking ahead to many more years of Knox. So we're trying in this panel to bring together the past, the present, and mostly the future um, of Knox research. Now, in this panel, I have a great honor to have um, four distinguished panelists. So uh, I will start with uh, Bill Daly, who probably doesn't need any introduction, uh, but for the sake of uh, context here, uh, one second, because I'm trying to share. Uh, so can you see my slide? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Now we can. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so for the sake of context, uh, this is a short bio uh, that will not, do justice to Bill's uh, outstanding career is just a few data points. Uh, he joined NVIDIA uh, in 2009 as a chief scientist uh, after 12 years at Stanford University, who was the chair of the CS department. Uh, he had multiple contributions in a variety of areas, uh, circuits, systems, um, synchronization uh, that is and many of these led many of these contributions are used uh, in large parallel computers today. Before that, uh, Bill was uh, affiliated with uh, MIT, and uh, there his contributions are uh, remarkable: the J machine and the M machine, um, experimental parallel computer systems. Um, then we have Axel Jans from TU Vienna. Um, Axel was a professor of uh, electronic systems design at KTH in Stockholm between 2002 and 2014. Then after 2014, he moved to TUVN where he is a professor uh, of systems on chip. Uh, he published uh, many uh, contributions in uh, various conferences, journals, books, and he's one of the pioneers of NOC <coughs> and uh, an interesting thing, he seems to be the first person in the world to have used the word NOC first in a print, uh, in a print version. Then we have uh, from Intel Corporation, uh, Michael Kishinevsky, who is a senior principal engineer leading the system design and architectures group in, uh, in, the, in uh, Oregon Strategic CAD Labs. Uh, his group developed multiple uh, automation technologies that are used in Intel in uh, various areas, primarily analysis and exploration. Uh, he authored uh, several books and uh, many journal and conference papers. He received um, uh, the, the Outstanding Mentor Award a couple of times from Semiconductor Research Corporation and also um, uh, test paper from uh, International Conference, Design Automation and International Conference on uh, Concurrency. And last but not least, we have uh, Umit uh, Ogras from uh, University of Wisconsin. Um, he was previously a researcher at Intercorporation. He actually worked with Mike on uh, first generation of NOCs. There, then he was for a number of years at Arizona State University. Uh, before moving as an associate professor to University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has uh, multiple accolades, <coughs> um, 
DARPA Young Faculty Award, NSF Career Award, Best Paper Awards, Best Transactions on CAD and DLSI Best Paper Awards, and an EDA Outstanding Decision uh, um, Dissertation Award for his PhD thesis. Um, now, when I thought about this panel, um, I thought to put down a few questions that are, you know, kind of starters. So the questions, the three questions that I asked the panelists to provide uh, their view or the opening statement, if you wish, are listed here. So um, these are things that came up in some discussion I had with Axel offline before, over the summer, before this panel materialized and uh, with uh, other people that I was talking about this uh, organizing this panel. So you see the questions here, the panelists will address them or start from them and go into other questions, maybe even more interesting. Uh, I just listed them here to see um, what will be the, the starting point. So the first one is about massive parallel architectures that dominate the accelerator and GPU designs these days. The question is if they are in a golden age or they seem to be close to the near end of the potential for development. Then the second one is about the applications and workloads that may have the biggest impact on future systems. And then last but not least, since we have a lot of uh, young engineers among the, uh, us in the audience, we would like to know what these distinguished panelists uh, foresee as being important for, the, for their education. And also what kind of results uh, or what kind of impact should various sponsors ranging from industry to NSF expect over the next three, five, three to five years. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to let Bill um, present his viewpoint. And uh, um, if I understand it correctly, the sharing is enabled. So Bill, you could share your slides. Uh, okay, I, I thought you were you collected all our slides. You would have a comment. I did. On the, uh... I did. I can do that too. I don't know if it's uh, easier for you. I, I, because... It's easier for me to advance it if I do it this way. Otherwise, I have to tell you about. But let me bring it up here because I, I didn't right. realize you could do that. Um, sure. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I collected all of them just for the backup in case uh, something goes wrong with any of the connections. Yeah, take your time because we yeah, we, um, we have some flexibility here. I'll yeah, stop no, sharing I, I, my I can share it right now. Okay. Um, let me just get it in slideshow mode and uh, hit share here. Yeah, so I, uh, I went through uh, your questions. Let's see. Uh, so you're seeing my slides now? Yes. They are. Okay. Uh, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, a little bit of this will be redundant with my talk this morning, but I thought I should answer all the questions. So um, NOx are a critical component of all modern system on chips. Um, this is true for CPUs, GPUs, and accelerators. You know, I show here as an example, our Grace uh, CPU chip with 72 uh, ARM cores. Um, they're connected along with the caches uh, via this scalable coherence fabric um, that also connects up to the LPDDR memory controllers and, and to the uh, communications of the rest of the system, the MVLink um, chip to chip where you can connect two of these uh, together to have 144 core super chip or to a uh, um, copper CPU to have very close coupling um, between them. And then the PCIe and MVLink to connect up to other places in the system. Um, so it's really critical um, to take a slide directly out of my talk this morning. Um, what's critical about them is the energy. Much of the energy of the system is in the communications. So we need to build minimum energy knocks. We need to move bits from one place to another with absolutely the least energy possible. That usually means taking the shortest possible physical distance. Um, most of the latency for the remote operations is in the communication as well. Um, even for large LLCs, we actually build them out of small cache arrays, you know, memory arrays. And the, accessing those small memory arrays is very fast, one cycle. Um, all the time is getting to that memory array and getting back to the CPU that made the request. Latency is important for CPUs because CPUs are what you use to run your latency sensitive code. That's why the single, they're optimized for single thread performance with lots of speculation out of order execution and all of that stuff, which also makes them horribly inefficient. Um, when you do have um, enough parallelism, that's why it's better to run the code on a GPU or even an accelerator where um, that parallelism then can hide the latency and you become much less concerned uh, about latency and you don't need to waste energy to get the best possible single thread performance. 
So NOx need to optimize energy and latency. The latency is mostly for CPUs, for GPUs and accelerators. It's all about energy. Bandwidth really isn't an issue. You can just add more wires and get as much bandwidth as you need. Um, um, one of the questions was about workloads and the answer is AI. Um, almost everything we do today either is run by AI or will be in the near future. Um, all sorts of stuff on the internet, um, image, speech, language, um, deciding what ad to stick up in front of you, deciding what product to recommend you buy at Amazon. Um, that's all um, AI. Um, medicine and biology being revolutionized by AI, um, starting with you know image processing for uh, medical images, um, looking at um, you know you know protein folding. Now the best protein folding is done via AI. Drug discovery. Um, that's all AI. Uh, media and entertainment. Um, all sorts of stuff. Content creation. Uh, caption of captioning of videos and images, searching images um, is AI. Security and defense is very rapidly uh, moving in this direction. Anomaly detection is a great way of, of, of providing security and things like networks and, and via video surveillance. Um, face detection, I mean, there are some um, you know, ethical concerns here. There are parts of the world where you walk anywhere, you're on um, a, a you know, video camera, and that video camera is being fed into face recognition, and they know where you are every minute of the day. Um, and then autonomous machines, um, you know, self-driving cars are, are you know, going to be here very soon. We already have little robots delivering pizzas down city streets and the like, and all these things are, are driven by AI. So the, um, the, the application workload in the future is AI. This sort of shows, you know, the NVIDIA stack with our GPUs, CPUs, DPUs, NICs, switches, and, and the like at the bottom, and then going up. And if you've got all these applications across the top, you know, Modulus is our, our um, package for physical simulation. It's largely driven by AI today. Clara is our healthcare package, again, um, dominated by AI, mostly for image analysis. Uh, Reva is our speech system. Maxine is our virtual avatars. Nemo is our recommendation system. All of these applications um, across the top, Drive is autonomous vehicles, Isaac is robotics, are driven by AI. So AI is the application, um, and um, it has, I think, two real good characteristics. Insatiable demand for compute and data. The compute tends to be very low precision. For inference, it's four or eight bit, not the big double precision we're used to for scientific computation. But it pulls in a lot of data as well. The recommender systems use terabytes of data. So you really have to be able to access that data quickly, and that requires communication. There is lots of parallelism. So it's, it's all about the, the uh, energy, not about the latency. Um, in that question as well, were a bunch of emerging technologies mentioned, the quantum and photonics were specifically mentioned, I always add neuromorphic because those are the three I hear together whenever I talk to program managers in Washington and the like. So, you know, quantum is not going to be a factor in the next decade. Um, you know, it's one of these technologies that if they ever get it to work and completely revolutionize a small number of algorithms that are characterized by small data, because moving data in and out of the cryostat is very expensive, um, and large compute. Um, you know, factoring the product of two prime numbers is a classical example. It would be very useful for quantum chemistry as well. But if you look at the number of qubits they have and the, and the noise of each qubit um, and come up with your most optimistic projection of that, it's not going to reach a level that will be um, commercially useful in the next decade. Um, photonics are, is useful for the you know, large scale networks, for networks between nodes. Um, basically, it's always been useful for long distance communication. And the definition of long distance gets smaller uh, periodically, roughly having every five years. So today, you know, our, our break point where we go from electrical cables to <clears throat> optical cables is around a meter. Um, I would expect five years from now, maybe it'll be a half a meter. Um, and, and by the way, when you make it that break point, your cost increases by a factor of 10. The optical communication is roughly an order of magnitude more expensive than the same band with electrical communication. And then neuromorphic, which is often also mentioned in these emerging technologies, is not competitive. Um, if you look at it from an accuracy, a model point of view, an energy per operation point of view, um, and, um, all, all of the things that that you know are matter for an AI application, um, digital beats it on, on every front, often by large amounts. Um, so let me wrap up with answering the question about education. Um, my real concern with a lot of the people um, I see when, when I interview people to hire today is that they're too narrow. Um, and I would encourage educators to educate what I, what I think of as chip architects, which means that they need to understand the circuit technology, perhaps even the device technology, um, the architecture, the key applications, the compilers. And since AI is the dominant application, you know, the, the important AI, AI models, you know, transformers, uh, recommender systems and, and the like, 
convolutional neural networks, I think, are almost a dead technology at this point. Um, and um, I, I think that if they know those things, they can then make the right trade-offs to cross different layers of the of the abstraction stack. If they're very narrow and say, oh, I only do architecture, I don't do circuits, I don't do applications, then they're in a box, right? And there's only so far you can go within that box without moving things outside that box. And it makes their utility a lot less. So with that, I will close and, and hand it over to whoever's next. Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, I'll turn it over to Axel. Uh, can you share the slides, please? Okay. Hello. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. So let me see. Can you see my slide? Not yet. I see it. Okay. Yes. So, yes. Uh, um, I think actually Bill said it almost everything already. <laughs> so let me uh, see if I can add some some interesting points. Um, um, I think um, now we have yeah, 20 years of uh, NOC research. I, I, I guess actually that all the main concepts have been formulated. I don't see any revolution, any revolutionary new concept coming up, but there is plenty of uh, possibility to, um, to improve and optimize because we see uh, specialized demands uh, all over the place. Um, we have uh, seen in, in Bill's uh, uh, slides now that uh, there is a, a huge demand of parallelism, in particular in, in machine learning. DNN-based uh, machine learning is uh, very uh, parallel, which means uh, we need to move around uh, a lot of data. And those networks, uh, those DNNs, uh, in fact, have um, a specialized demand. So depending on what kind of network uh, you, you have uh, for a time uh, series, uh, it's different. Uh, for, for images, uh, it's again different. So I can imagine that there is a space for um, two, three, four different types of specialized accelerators. Uh, that um, uh, Axel. Axel, yes. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Um, there is a rectangle. Can you move it, please? It's a black rectangle uh, that uh, covers part of your slide. Yes, yes. That uh, one? Sorry, that was yeah, or, or if you can minimize it or something. Uh, it's still covering a corner. Yes, okay. Sorry. No problem. <clears throat> Um, so, the, so I can see the, the need of uh, uh, two, three, four different types of uh, accelerator architectures, uh, which uh, will require uh, different um, NOCs because they have different demands and needs for communication. Um, then, uh, yeah, I think the, the bulk of the NOC research uh, is applying and optimizing what we already have established. But of course, uh, we, it's very hard to predict uh, technology and there may be some dis disruptions uh, around the corner, uh, even though we, we are not, it, it's not obvious at the moment. Optical networks on chip have been mentioned. Uh, I don't see it happening right now either. Uh, but of course, uh, if, they, if, that bec the, if we see a breakthrough there, that will in fact change the balance between performance uh, power and cost of communication versus uh, computation. And that would mean that uh, we need to, to find new, new uh, op uh, optimization points. Um, yeah, I don't know if quantum uh, communication or entanglement-based communication ever becomes mature, but of course that would be a game changer. Uh, so on the other hand, I, th I think, uh, not knowing what ex what technology exactly uh, is um, is developing in in five or ten years, but new technology can always change the balance between computing and communication and storage, and that would mean that in all cases means that we have to uh, re-optimize um, uh, our our communication network. So. Uh, I think there is another point to, to keep in mind. Uh, SOCs and NOCs architecture has always been hampered that uh, the, the market only allows for two or three, four winners because uh, it requires huge volumes. 
So we cannot um, hope that we can experiment with uh, 10, 20 um, different architectures in the marketplace at the same time, because the number four or five simply do not command the, the volumes necessary to uh, support the, the costs of uh, development, manufacturing, uh, and the, the ecosystem. Applications, um, um, yes, I think the parallel, the parallel algorithms, uh, they uh, are a booster for, for NOCs, and there, are, there is machine learning uh, in particular. Um, I'm not sure that the term AI is really the right term. I, I prefer to use machine learning because AI has another component, uh, which is uh, very difficult to uh, parallelize. And um, I, I, um, I have realized this recently that uh, all the machine learning uh, techniques that we use today, they are based on, on massive amounts of data, but almost by definition, they cannot uh, solve the long tail problem of the statistics of the data, which means uh, that uh, for those long tails, uh, we will need other approaches, uh, which are most likely much more sequential. So we'll see what, uh, what balance we will find there. But these DNN accelerators, as I mentioned, uh, they have special communication needs. Uh, and uh, I can, can uh, see the experimentation of different accelerators. Uh, and I would uh, expect that we will uh, see uh, perhaps um, two, three, four different types of uh, accelerators uh, that will offer uh, new architectures and new demands for the NOC uh, architecture, architectures and optimizations. So they, they are by in, in a way almost optimal because they, um, for, for NOCs, because they require very high uh, communication bandwidth. Uh, they also uh, will come in high volumes. Uh, so as Bill also pointed out, there are plenty of applications where these machine learning uh, applications are very, very useful and this is only uh, growing. Um, and we, uh, we have a number of different uh, DNN types uh, and these uh, DNN networks evolve also very quickly. So we will see new types uh, in a few years, which again will require uh, the support of different uh, SOC and NOC architectures. So what are the future technology? Photonic uh, communication on chip, I think, uh, will uh, change the game if it uh, becomes um, uh, ready. I don't see this happening yet, but uh, it, uh, yeah, it may be there in a, in a couple of years. Uh, if we have a photonic uh, network in the chip or in the package, uh, that will, of course, um, make uh, the NLC uh, quite different because uh, yeah, of the different properties of uh, photons. Uh, we cannot do uh, buffering. We, cannot, we, do, we will not um, convert between electronics and photonics a lot. So it will be a very different um, uh, division between communication and computation. I think packaging and the, the 3D integration is something which is happening right now. I, I just uh, saw the, the white paper of this universal chiplet interconnect express. Uh, this is supposed to, to provide an interface between the chiplets in the package. Uh, so this is the, the package here. And then we have lots of different chiplets inside the package, which can come from different providers with different uh, technologies. Uh, and there I can see a, a, a fantastic playground for, uh, hetero, for, for hierarchical heterogeneous NOCs uh, that extend um, yeah, inside the package, but also into some of the SOC chiplets uh, uh, that we have uh, in the package. So that is definitely an interesting uh, area of research. And I think that was uh, all from my side for, for now. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Thank you. Uh, so, Mike, if you can take it over. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? 
Yes. So the first vector I wanted to discuss is uh, scaling. Um, uh, modern designs uh, by many companies and academia uh, moving towards, instead of doing a monolithic uh, chip design, it's a family of chips, it's a set of chips. Uh, so here is an example from recent hot chips of a future Intel product in the client space uh, called Media Lake. And you can see there is a CPU tile, SOC tile, GPU tile, IO extended tile. And this is connected through the base tile and packaged substrate. And wires are going here through 3D uh, form of integration uh, for RS in case of Intel and 2.5D integration in general. And what it buys uh, additional modularity because you can redesign uh, certain components of this uh, packaging solution without touching other components. And you can actually improve your yield because now the area of each of these individual chips is smaller. And you can also uh, select process technology node which is more friendly to a particular uh, application all libraries, even if it is the same technology node. For example, GPU requires denser libraries and maybe CPU requires uh, faster uh, transistors and uh, bigger uh, cells, but faster um, uh, performance. And IO with analog and mix signal uh, would benefit from all the technology nodes. You don't really want to scale up. And if you look at the high end, again, uh, Intel example, Ponte Vecchia is a product coming in uh, GPGPU, the main uh, high end graphics. Again, it's a bunch of different tiles. Uh, uh, in, in this case, it's uh, 47 active tiles connected through different form of 3D and 2.5D uh, integration. Um, and if you look into more esoteric solutions, then let's say Cerebras at Hot Chip demonstrated this wafer scale uh, computing where you have 84 dice uh, connected uh, on, on a wafer. And so what this means for NLC is that strictly speaking, NLC is growing to network and package and maybe network and wafer. And of course, if we look at the data center scale solution, then it becomes network and warehouse scale computer data center. And so it's a vector of scaling. And as you do this scaling, both inside a single chip and inside the package, um, flat structures usually don't do it anymore. You need to solve a problem of hierarchy. Maybe you want to cluster different IP blocks on one type of interconnect and then treat it as a single module, inject into another level of interconnect. And this uh, gives you new trade-offs comparing to flat structures. And it's also a question of heterogeneity because you have coherent interconnect between CPUs and you have accelerators and GPUs, which may not need coherency. You have uh, IO, uh, different forms of IO integrated in the same package or on the same day. And of course you have uh, different forms of memories. Uh, in, in some cases, heterogeneous memories like high bandwidth memory and DDR5, let's say for, for server products. The second vector um, is uh, that of optimization. Uh, with advances in machine learning and AI, uh, we have now very powerful gray box and black box optimization techniques, which are essentially based on uh, different forms of sampling of a target system. And then underneath they're building some surrogate models of the system and use these surrogate models to drive the optimization. For example, Bayesian optimization would use probabilistic machine learning, such as Gaussian processes and then reinforcement learning, 
which might be used for dynamic optimization uh, is uh, possibly building some optimal policy of control uh, by approximating them with uh, different families of neural networks. And what they do, they uh, at every iteration send some values of, of parameters or knobs to the target system to evaluate, and then they read results of the objectives and telemetry from the target system. And then they iterate in a parallel or sequential fashion. And at any process point in this process, uh, because this is typically multi-objective optimization, you would have uh, a Pareto front of optimal solutions, which is typically better than your initial configuration of the system. Many uh, companies and academic uh, groups are building uh, such frameworks. Here I'm showing sort of a cartoonish view of our system. And one want to potentially apply this to um, communication fabrics. Why not to take a NOC or maybe a network in a package and try to apply it as a particular instance of the target system. Uh, if you do it pre-silicon, you would do it on a simulation model. And the first challenge at uh, fabric detail simulation might be very slow because you may need a significant number of sampling points and if the simulation is slow then it will take too much time to iterate through this process and of course if you attempt system simulation because you want to uh, optimize or tune uh, the fabric solution uh, in in the context of realistic workloads then you will have uh, a few orders of magnitude slower execution. Now, the second challenge here is the workload models because you can design communication fabrics for essentially worst case uh, bounds of, of the behavior by using synthetic traffic. But maybe you want to tune these fabrics and make sure it works uh, well on workloads uh, of interest. And the way we do workloads often in computer architecture is by doing sampling of these long workloads with traces and we run pre-silicon simulation using these short snippets of workload behavior. Now these snippets are typically legacy snippets. They are not addressing the latest and greatest applications like let's say AI. And also because they are short, uh, they might be very inaccurate. So uh, research on how to do trustable workload models, how to do it quickly, and exercise in optimization ex exploration frameworks is uh, something worth doing. And the final challenge here is that it just too many knots uh, in, in the communication fabrics. Uh, let's take an example. Uh, we want to optimize uh, a single parameter of uh, one actor on network on chip. Let's say it's uh, the number of credits given for transactions in flight to, to memory when CPU is communicated to memory. And you want to select an optimal number for agents uh, on, on day. Let's say we have 100 different agents and all of them uh, may possibly have a different number because they are located in different areas of the day. Congestion is different and distances to memory controllers are different. And uh, so it may not be the same number. Of course, you can solve a problem for a single number uh, very simply because it's a 1D, uh, one dimensional uh, optimization problem. But if you want uh, to be optimal, you may want to solve it for 100 uh, different dimensions, which would be 100 different agents on your day. And of course, in reality, you don't have a single parameter you want to optimize. Maybe you have tens parameters for each of your agent or for each of your route. And then if you have 10 parameters and there are 10 agents uh, in a system, then you are in a situation, multi-dimensional situation of 1,000 dimensions. 
symmetries may help because uh, maybe for two agents which are sitting on different boundaries of your die, the situation is completely symmetric and you don't need to differentiate. And so you can, in principle, cluster uh, different subsystems and reduce dimensions this way. But understanding these symmetries also requires special techniques and some time in this exploration process. And so this remains a challenge. In general, it's difficult to build a good quality machine learning model uh, for communication fabrics because of the scaling of, of the number of agents. And so to solve the first problem of uh, this slow simulation, what one may do is something uh, along the lines of automated abstraction. And this is our joint work with uh, Ume Tokras group on uh, building a model compiler, which would take fabric topology, design parameters and traffic flows and automatically compile you uh, executable analytical latency or bandwidth models. And then you can, if they're accurate enough, then you can replace uh, your NOC simulation uh, with, with this executable analytical model. You can replace it entirely for some applications, so maybe you can do gear switching in a multimodal environment. And you can attempt to do this uh, automatic uh, abstraction through machine learning techniques. Uh, I explained uh, before that it's challenging because of the number of features in these models. Uh, you can instead use tune theory, which is if you understand the microarchitecture of the fabric well enough, you can automatically construct a queuing network. And solving these queuing networks is in general intractable, but you can uh, do some formal network transformations, which will produce an abstraction of this queuing network as a set of independent queues with modified uh, transformed service rates, which becomes a very tractable situation. You just now solve individual queues uh, separately and you are getting this, uh, let's say, latency model. And there is some reading on this if somebody is interested. Now, the challenges with this uh, uh, is that even though it, uh, of course, helps exploration and system modeling, um, if, if uh, these abstraction uh, uh, frameworks exist, uh, but to build a trustable uh, network queuing model, uh, you do need to understand the microarchitecture. And, of the fabric. And as this microarchitecture may change from one generation to another generation, you need uh, generalization to more classes of fabrics. Um, and how to do it fully automatically is not yet clear. Uh, you, you need to do uh, some technology development on this. Finally, the question on uh, what is important in academic and interaction between industry and academia. Uh, the first vector here is that if uh, academic groups do not have access to advanced packaging and design technologies, uh, they may miss on uh, real challenges of, of the design, both at uh, SOC or system and package or uh, network and chip. Uh, levels and of course it become an increasingly difficult uh, to get this access. Um, so this is something maybe to be addressed uh, collectively between industry and academia. Um, the second vector um, here is that oftentimes design of network on chips uh, is treated as completely logical exercise and physical awareness is completely out of the picture, but in reality, this design, of course, should be done in the context of the cheap floor plan. Um, and one should do co-exploration of floor planning and macro placement and fabric, and in general, not just fabric, but SOC or system and package, because of course, all these IP blocks takes a lot of area and they may influence the way you, you design the, uh, the fabric. Also, sometimes we see a sort of historic disconnect on fabrics of interest. 
For example, uh, many companies for years were doing design of uh, bouncing coherent fabrics. Uh, and this started in the research in digital corporation in 90s. And then Intel and IBM and ARM uh, were producing some versions of these fabrics. But the academic research was fully focused on uh, these fully buffered fabrics with uh, heavier routers. Um, and so sometimes we see that industry, at least part of industry and academia are working in different spaces. And maybe interaction can be improved such that uh, uh, other classes of fabrics is addressed, uh, at least in some research. That's it. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, last but not least, to meet. Please go ahead. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So I will uh, try to wrap it quickly since uh, it is aligned with a lot of the talks we have seen so far. So communication is a fundamental component of uh, electronic systems and actually in life. So there will be a need for network on something. It could be network on chip, package, or wafer, as long as there is need for data movement. And on top of that, as everything else becomes uh, lower cost, uh, faster, so must uh, the communication. So therefore, I want to echo what Bill uh, told both, uh, like said, both in the keynote and the panel. The solution that will enable the minimum communication, the lowest cost uh, communication energy and latency, the simplest solution will actually win. So uh, in short, communication is like uh, management. It is a necessary overhead. And uh, the solutions that will minimize this cost uh, in terms of energy and latency are those uh, that will be uh, used. Now, if you look at uh, NOCs, it, they became necessary because we had many cores on a single die, and right now they became commodity. They have been used in many commercial uh, devices. So we see a lot of meshes in uh, large-scale systems, some uh, custom NOCs on smaller uh, SOCs, but uh, they became mostly in-house uh, tools uh, and commodities. Moving forward, there is always uh, more and more need for uh, data-driven complex uh, ML and uh, AI models like CNNs, DNNs, now graph neural net networks, moving to attention, attention models. So we will, moving forward, we will have more and more uh, data, need for more and more massively parallel uh, computation. Now, uh, implementing all these on a single die becomes uh, expensive, uh, like Mike, uh, was presenting. So we may move uh, from a single chip uh, package to multiple chiplets or multiple chips uh, on a, a package. So we may have just a different type of problem from NOCs, we may go to networks on chip, but the fundamental idea will remain the same, the importance of communicating with minimum uh, overhead. So here we may have intra-chiplet NOCs and inter-chiplet uh, uh, NOPs. And they may look different because of the trade-offs. Like for example, we may have much more bandwidth uh, on the chip. So we may have free wires, uh, whereas on the package, we may have lower uh, bandwidth and that will, drive, uh, that will drive the details of the design. <clears throat> now moving even further, uh, we may see wafer scale integration. Now we may have networks on wafer or something else. We may have 2.5D, 3D. I recently heard 5.5D, like more integration. We'll see uh, more tightly integrated memory and uh, processing. Some of the chiplets may be more, like they may have uh, more memory. Then we may have different types of heterogeneous uh, processing. Looking back to the communication, uh, we may actually observe the same uh, heterogeneity. So. We don't need to really pick one uh, NOC, one uh, choice over another. So due to the trade-offs, specific trade-offs on the chip or on the chiplet within a die, we may have still electrical uh, connections, but across different chiplets or across uh, packages um, or across the wafer, we may have uh, optical 
or wireless. So they may change uh, this. There are multiple variables here, moving parts, both the uh, optical or wireless, the technologies are changing. And at the same time, the design trade-offs are changing. So as a result, um, some heterogeneous combination could actually be the key. Again, the winner is likely to the one that will provide the minimum energy and latency uh, overhead. Uh, as a different dimension, uh, we will continue to see design problems. Now, we will not only floor plan a single chip, but we will, uh, or place map to a single uh, chip, but we will have to do many of them. So management will be also more difficult. Uh, if we have wafer scale, for example, cooling, uh, dynamic thermal and power management will become relevant, like extremely relevant, but with completely very different uh, trade-offs. So uh, system level optimization under these new trade-offs are uh, or going to be extremely important. Uh, the last point uh, I think is very important is on education. Uh, Many schools, or maybe there are very few schools which can provide a real hands-on experience with a real hands-on chip design experience. So there is a very important step, uh, CHIPS Act. I think that right now um, I'm also partly uh, involved with, an, uh, with some effort to make a practical experience uh, a reality to undergrad students. But there is here, uh, like despite that, I want to talk about uh, uh, trade-off. So there is only uh, so many courses uh, students can take. So they may have uh, maybe expertise on devices, circuits, architectures, on some aspect uh, which is critical, but uh, then they may lack the system level view. If they focus more on just uh, system level or architecture and then leave the rest, the picture will be incomplete. So there is, I don't know uh, whether there is a uh, clean, uh, like a clear answer to this, but uh, one possibility is uh, multi-semester, possibly cross-class uh, projects. So one class may focus on designing the circuits, another one can focus more on the architectures, and another one can take them to reality, another can do testing. Even if students don't take all of them, maybe some synopsis of learnings from one another can uh, can be communicated across uh, different projects. Or then maybe uh, one class where they design, next semester they test uh, their design. So maybe an innovative uh, reimagining the curriculum can uh, address the education problem such that students go more prepared, uh, understanding uh, both design and uh, system level aspects. Thank you. All right, thank you, Umit. Thank you, everyone, uh, for the interesting opening uh, points. So, um, in the last part of this panel, I'd like to open the floor to the audience to have some questions that uh, any of the panelists can address. Um, I do have a question that I got offline uh, by one of the NOC participants over the years, David Bertozzi. So I'm going to read it from the email he sent me. It's kind of long question, but hopefully we'll be able to start some interesting discussion. So the question is like this. Several researchers have observed that oftentimes new computing architectures of any kind are presented while devoting only a few words or lines of text to their built-in on-chip networks. The first reaction to this is disappointment, but when thinking about the possible root causes for this, a few hypotheses come to mind. A, the NOCs are such a commodity component of computer architecture that the existing commercial NOCs is just fine. Or you can easily design your own special NOC in-house without needing for special expertise. This makes the role of NOC rather anonymous in the end product. B, NOCs are not essential components to define the non-functional properties of the, uh, of the design, um, given the requirements of, of the application at hand. They just would fill some functional uh, requirements. So basically, um, we have, 
our papers for many years ago with this that NOC consumes a large amount of total chip power or determine the final system performance, but in real life, this might not be the case, at least for emerging applications. The side effect of, of this is that emerging applications see what we call anonymous NOCs. In other words, whatever we present is just fine. But one gets access, uh, one gets access to details, one may easily find out that these NOCs are heavily suboptimal and uh, uh, that's the problem. So the question is, what are the panelists takes the take on anonymous role of N quote unquote anonymous role of NOCs in today computing platforms, hence on the low profile that our scientific community is forced to keep. Uh, Bill, you're muted, I think. So sorry about that. Um, I think it's one of these yeah. things where the NOC is very important, but you know, when the marketing people are trying to decide how to sell their AI accelerator chip, you know, they, they're thinking about what their customers want to hear. And the customers want to hear, I'm top of the ML perf, perf charts, and I have so many tops per watt, and I can run so many, you know, vision transformers, you know, per second. Um, and the customers don't want to hear about the NOC. So it's kind of like the tires on your car. They're really important and your car wouldn't run very well if they weren't there, but that's not what sells the car to the customers. Maybe it should, um, but that's not the way you know, the, the marketing and PR people look at the chip as a whole. Uh, quick comment, if you go to Formula One, it's very, very different story. Tires are a central piece, actually more than five or 10 years ago, right? So yeah, but I, I, I got your point. Any other comment on this? Well, I, I I fully agree, and uh, based on experience in, in our company, certainly this requires people with expertise in this domain. It's not that anybody can do it. Okay, yeah. So uh, we also have a question online, which networks are better for inter-chiplet communication, wire, wireless, photonic, or others? Should we address the inter-chip separately from the intra-chip NOC, would an inter-chip communication be a bottleneck, like single main memory bottleneck in shared memory systems? Question was asked by Mohamed Fadur Reza. Well, uh, for optical, I think Bill address where the trade-off is currently is. Uh, it's not inside the package and it's certainly not inside the chip. Wireless is doable technically both uh, on a day and between days without interfering with electrical communication. But the benefits of the wireless, uh, which are not yet fully proven, can be only for broadcasting of uh, messages. So wireless cannot replace uh, electrical communication entirely. It might be potentially used as a complement to the electrical uh, for, for broadcast communication. Do we have any actual wireless product, uh, wireless NOC product? I am aware I of research. Yeah. I, I don't know I, if I, I, I'm not aware TV. of this. I know that Intel labs do have research on this, uh, but uh, it's not in the product. I think for both the wireless and the photonic, you have this issue that you need to produce the electrical signal at that bit rate first. If you're not going very far, it's just a lot more energy efficient to keep it electrical and send it over there. And if you're going to send it wireless, you then have to send it into something which modulates it and drive an antenna and have an antenna on the other side. And the only reason to add that complexity is if is if the, the wire link isn't good enough. If you have a wire link that's good enough, then why do that? And so for, you know, for anything that's sort of package scale, I can't see anybody going to any exotic technology. I mean, just plain old electrical wires are fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, I think I want to add something about that. Uh, so it may not be the bottleneck depending on the mapping of the workload to the NOP or NOC. So if the workload is mapped very poorly, that there is a lot of communication between different chiplets. Yes, the inter-chiplet communication may be the bottleneck, but we have uh, room for optimization to partition the workload such that uh, most of the communication will remain within a chip. 
and less will go out of chiplet. So through that, it doesn't have to be the bottleneck. Perhaps I can can add to this question. So I think uh, to find the optimal solution, of course, it would be nice to have an uh, a, a globally designed uh, hierarchical network that covers both the individual chiplet and the the, the package level. But I think the reality will be that they, they come from different sources, uh, so they will not be designed at the same time uh, and they will be heterogeneous. So what we actually would need is uh, good interfaces, which are not bus-like interfaces, but actually knock-like interfaces for the network to actually uh, deal, yeah, uh, feed the, the, the packet end-to-end -end, uh, in an optimized way across this, uh, this boundaries of the different uh, networks. So, um, speaking of the heterogeneity aspect, I was wondering what would be your take on, for instance, extreme technology scaling. So, if we go even more, more than this, what will be the implications in the NOC evolution, so to speak? Um, I remember in Bill's keynote saying that the quantum is likely not to happen for te 10 years or so, which I tend to agree. But I'm wondering... Um, if we think, say, five years from now or whatever, assuming even more scaling, what, what will be the implications on the NOC evolution? And when you say scaling, uh, you, you are talking about what? Uh, about technology scaling? Technology, scaling yeah, yeah, the... technology. Yeah, te technology. Well, one thing I see is, is yeah. go ahead. Go ahead, though. No. Well, uh, just just one note. Quantum is not scaling. Quantum is a different branch uh, in in computing, right? Uh, and quantum is happening today, and there might be instances of applications of quant quantum in cloud for security purposes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, within five or ten years. But it's not mass producing devices, which uh, sort of a lot of engineers will be uh, caring about. Mm -hmm. It's one thing I, I would say is that you know, when you look at future technologies, one thing I've always observed is that the wires get worse every generation. As, as you, uh, you make, make the wires narrower, um, the res resistivity, or I should say the resistance of the wire goes up. It's actually even worse than you would think because the surface roughness of, of the uh, copper on the wires. And then the capacitance stays about the same because you're also um, closing the distances. And so, you know, making them smaller makes the capacitance go down, but then making the distances less makes it go back up to where it was. And so the wires get slower every generation. I think that that puts um, real demands on the knock to keep mm -hmm. the latency under control. Um, and in particular on circuits to try to overcome the, uh, the slow wires. So, in other words, is the circuits level research that should find a solution to this slow well, wires problem? Good solutions are found across many levels. I see. I see. Okay. Any other comment on this? Hello, uh, I'm Alan, Professor Marculescu's uh, student. I have a more general question, but um, when Moore stated his law, right, a long time ago, we started from having one core on a CPU to multiple cores. And now people started like AMD, for example, having chiplets and multiple chiplets on a single uh, CPU, for example. Do you think, one, do you think Moore's law is in fact actually dead? And two, how scalable would it be to have chiplets go multi, Chiplet being the new core, so to say, in going further down, 10 years, 20 years. What, yeah. what do you think? Yeah. Well, a couple of comments. First of all, when Moore coined his law in 1965, um, we did not have even one core on a chip. We had you know, a, a handful of transistors on a chip. And, and if you actually go back and read the paper, which I think preciously few people have actually done, you'll find that the Moore's law is not about cores. It's about the economy of fabricating transistors. And Moore's law is almost certainly dead because I observe going from one generation to another that the transistors are no longer getting less expensive. 
right? His, his observation was that the transistors would get less expensive exponentially each generation. Um, and now the transistors are going up in cost. And in fact, the, the motivation for breaking big die up into chiplets has to do with economics. It has to do with trying to you know, find a, a point where you get better yield by making smaller chiplets and then assemble them together into a larger chip, which would have you know, you know, lower yield and hence be more expensive if you were to do it monolithic. I think from the performance point of view, um, it's always better to make the monolithic chip because you pay something um, both in adding I.O. circuitry, which adds latency and costs energy, and in the signaling between the chips uh, to get through the chiplets. And it's a bottleneck, right? It, it, it is a, it, it, you know, we have, you know, piles of wires on the chip, but now you have way fewer wires, even on a silicon interposer and fewer yet going to an organic package. So I think it, it's certainly, you know, sort of a, an arrow in our quiver to be able to chop things up into chiplets. The other method that is widely used to try to you know make large die and not have unacceptable yields um, at nvidia we call floor sweeping which is where we basically fabricate more processors and more memory controllers and more caches than we need and then at at uh, test time we find the ones that work and we fuse out the ones that don't and and we basically ship a product which is a it's a good product in the sense that everything we promise is working is working we have the right number of sms but there are actually more SMs than that on the die, and we're not counting on everyone working to ship the product. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, indeed, the uh, more paper is probably much more quoted than actually read. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I noticed that, yeah. So uh, staying along the lines of these uh, urgent issues for the research community, actually I'm thinking from Knox++ perspective. So what, what areas should we push uh, in the immediate years in order to, to kind of revamp or restart the, the interest in the symposium, say to, not sure if we can reproduce, but to get closer to the momentum that was in this area, say 10 years ago. Hmm. Well, it's probably not real popular with a lot of the knock people because they're not circuit people in general. But I actually think the biggest leverage is with is with circuits um, to try to figure out how to get more out of bad wires. Mm -hmm. How about the, from the application side? You, you mentioned AI or ML as a potential driver applications for this. Um, for instance, right now, if we have a good NOC paper that solves one of these, we cannot get much attention from the ML community, right? Because they lack the background, they lack other things. If you go into some well, hardware innovation. Well, there, is an, there is a branch in the ML community, which is dealing with the accelerator design. And I think yeah. there it is very important. And I think there are also lots of opportunities. So I, I feel uh, that should be a place uh, with uh, filled with excitement. So with with research uh, interest and opportunities but even so actually this goes mostly in conferences like i don't know I'll give you an example DAC, maybe iska maybe this where these people understand the innovation at the accelerator level or the architecture yes. or whatever. Uh, nothing from the mainstream uh, machine learning so yeah that's true i think the main, mainstream machine learning they are they are concerned with the networks and uh, the accuracy of the application so they don't care i mean how the data is moving around in the, in the yeah hardware. exactly in general the, <laughs> so, the network aspect yeah. behind this is completely yes yes obscure. but i think that is hard to to change um mm -hmm. yeah some people may, may care even in accelerator community, but designing a knock for accelerator uh, is not uh, the same as designing the whole accelerator. So it's only, only, a, always only part of the problem. Uh, uh, it's not the same as what? I, I could not. As hear. designing the whole thing, right? Knock oh, is oh, part see. of yes. the design. So if you want to present the paper on the accelerator, you need to describe the whole thing, the design of compute units for acceleration and the NOC. Uh, so carving out the NOC component may not be trivial. 
And for this reason, people do not uh, want to publish in Knox when they do design of accelerators, even, even mm -hmm. if they put some effort in designing of the Knox. Mm -hmm. We have a, a couple of questions. Actually, the last one may be maybe the first to take. Um, many thanks for the insightful perspectives by our distinguished panelists for early design exploration of accelerators and NLC, analytical models, including accelerator NOCs, are being increasingly used for PPA energy and energy analysis. Given Chiplet's era and re rise of emerging NOCs, wireless photonics, how accurate existing models are for chiplets and emerging technologies? Is possible to ensure high fidelity in this early exploration? I can speak for models which we were building. Yeah, I think it relates with, to, uh, to one of your points. Group. Mm -hmm. And for case coherent models on day for bouncing fabrics, we are achieving something like 90%, 95% accuracy, depending on the region of operation. Uh, the region of very high congestion is, is the most challenging region and some additional research is required. Uh, but the reason we are achieving this high accuracy is that we participated in design of these networks and we understand the microarchitecture of this network. In particular, is this system level simulation that accuracy that you talk about, or? Uh, well, the, this is a network on chip simulation accuracy. System level okay. simulation accuracy depends on what is the accuracy of other components because you need mm -hmm. to simulate the CPU. So this is so. just the network part? That's the network part. The system okay. level, depending on what you use for the other thing, can be lower accuracy, but still quite decent and uh, sufficient for many cases. Mm -hmm. And as okay. we move to new networks and new interconnects and system and packages, uh, these require similar frameworks for creating these automatic models because it's not feasible to create these models uh, just manually for high accuracy exploration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I can also add for the interchiplets, uh, like we don't have the reference point for NOCs, we know what is the reference point. So, therefore, after we develop a model, we can uh, measure the error. But uh, for interposers, networks on packages, at least as of now, maybe only the companies have access to the reference data. There is, uh, we don't have access to them. So that's why we don't know how accurate they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, there is one more question, I think it's for Bill, but I think this was addressed in the keynote, I think. Um, I think the, Madi the, had a question for some time. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, Radio, I, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. I think this is this was a great panel, and I appreciate all the interesting talks. Sorry if you see the if you hear my baby's uh, noise in the background. I appreciate it. I, I I I'm sorry about it. So, quick question. So, I think this question is about using uh, photonics in in Knox and in on the chip. And I heard that Bill mentioned, you know, this is photonics are mostly useful for longer distance communication, which I totally agree. And I understand that the energy is a big uh, part of this deal. You know, if we can break the energy down for using photonics, then probably that's going to be visible for it to be used um, on chip. At the same time, I think DARPA is pushing uh, photonics into the package. Um, so I think that's also interesting. So I have two questions. What should be the energy figures for an optical link if you want to put it on the chip? Second question, if as the uh, electrical links are becoming slower, as you just mentioned, Bill, do you think there will be a time that they will be too slow that we don't have any choice but to replace them with optics and then sacrifice the energy. Those, are, those are two good, yeah, two good questions. Let me let me address them in, in order. So in optical energy, I think that it would have to be competitive with electrical energy, which with a well-designed circuit is probably in the five to 10 femtojoule per bit millimeter range. 
right? So if you're crossing, say, a 20 millimeter chip um, at five femtojoules per millimeter, you'd have to get from one end of the chip to the other with 100 um, femtojoules per bit. Um, and so I think I think you would have to be in that range, and and um, and that's that's wall plug power. One, you know, a lot of the optical systems that I've seen will use things like ring resonators, um, where the modulation power will probably be more than that. But then you actually have a supply laser. Um, the supply laser might be five percent efficient. So to get you know sort of you know five dBm you know into that um, you know modulator, you know you actually need you know ten or twenty times that at the wall plug. Um, so you need to you need to do the all in calculation. I haven't seen anything that's um, competitive there yet. And then of course you also have to pay the electrical power to generate the high bit rate signal that drives the modulator. Um, and and, and you, you have to have a good electrical signal before you can turn it into an optical signal. Um, in terms of the electrical links too slow, we still know how to make fast wires, right? They're just not dense. Um, and in, in most technologies, you know, you'll have the wires with the, with the forty nanometer pitch. Then you'll have the wires with the 80 nanometer pitch. And then you'll have the wires on the upper couple metal layers that have like an 800 nanometer pitch. Um, and those wires are pretty fast. They're LC wires, not RC wires. And so they will have a latency that's, you know, comparable to the optical fiber. It's going to be, you know, half the speed of light if your dielectric constant's four. Um, and, and it's hard to beat that unless you can uh, you know, drive the dielectric constant down. And at most, you get another factor of two. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, um, is there any other question from the audience? So, to make sure that uh, uh, everyone who's connected one gets the chance to ask. I have a very different question then, if there is no other question. What's Sorry, your Roger. favorite? Uh, I oh, think there's, there's also question. one question from Sergi. Oh, I didn't see Sergi. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no worries. Okay, so thank, first of all, thank you for being here today and, and for this fantastic panel. So my question would be maybe naive, right? So it, I feel like this uh, analogy that you made with the with the tires of a car and so on, it feels like the knock has to sustain whatever the architecture needs to do, right? Or the application needs to do and not the opposite. So do you think there's a way that we can make a disruptive change in the interconnect that gives some feature that was not there, like broadcast or like long range or like something that is new that will force, not force, but maybe give the architects a new tool to play and do something different. Do you think that's possible and that not can drive innovation in the architecture and not vice versa? Yeah, I think that that's absolutely true. And I think that the, the way to do it is to look at where where things are too slow. And, and you know, I actually gave an example in, in the keynote, which is um, barrier synchronization. I mean, if, you, if your network doesn't support fast barriers, there are a lot of applications for which you will spend a noticeable amount of time every, every time step or whatever the you know, period of synchronization is, having every processor signal that I'm done, waiting to hear from every other processor that they're also done. And if you do that in software, it's really slow. It's a kind of feature you can add to a knock. And so I think, you know, barriers in particular in collective operations in general are a way of adding features to a knock that if they really relieve some bottleneck in the application can make a difference. Uh, but I think, you, again, it's knowing all the layers of the stack. You have to understand the application well enough to know where that would make a difference. Okay. Any other question? All right. If not, I have a quick question. I'm not sure if there will be any takers, but I'll be more than happy to see it. So do you have a favorite memory of 15 years of NOC that you would like to share? Mm -hmm. Technical or non-technical? I have two, but I'll maybe share and start with one. Is the NOC 2007, which was in Princeton, and uh, it was the first time when it had a uh, special sec session called Marketplace. And I remember staying in line, uh, I think Umit, you might have attended that with me, staying in line to show an FPGA demonstration of, uh, uh, of an NOC. And uh, that was one of the moments when I realized that it might be something behind it because people were still, you know, the Intel prototype was not publicly available and anything by then. And so it was kind of uh, an interesting thing. I, I remember from the 
many editions of Knox. Anyone else has a favorite moment to share or something? No, I right. remember people asking, will NOCs ever pan out? So they were asking, will they be ever useful? Yeah. Now, looking back, I see, I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Among the same lines, I remember the first visit at Intel when they showed the 80 core. And I saw that uh, prototype. Uh, it was right after uh, ICCC when it was shown in San Francisco. And this was uh, part of a GSRC review. And uh, I visited Intel. I think you were with me at that time. Yeah, and, uh, we saw the we saw the prototype, and it was like magic when you saw all that thing and sunk into that cooling liquid and doing. Uh, and I remember the question I asked: Okay, what does it do? And basically, the answer was nothing useful, just matrix multiplications. But it was still very spectacular. So it was a mem memorable uh, moment in the in the thing. And uh, not sure if many of you or some of you remember the wine we served at NOC, uh, NOC in 2011 in Pittsburgh. It was a remarkable one. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there. I, I don't remember the wine, but I've been there. And it was nice... <laughs> well, that's usually what happens, what, what good wine does to people. They, they don't remember. <laughs> okay. Uh... All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I think we can uh, close this uh, session and. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, yeah. some food for thought and uh, putting together the keynote and all the special sessions that we have today so probably this is a, a good way to end it and to thank the audience for sticking around and uh, for all the organizers for their effort to keep this alive in the under these circumstances and uh, especially the panelists that connected that uh, uh, probably a hectic time in their schedule. Thank you very much yeah. and uh, looking forward to the next year participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Radu. Bye, everybody. Yeah. So I still have to do the best paper award announcement and also the closing remarks. So it's just going to take two minutes. Um, let me just quickly share my screen over here. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. So, yeah, so for selecting the best paper award candidate, it's it's basically based on the initial comprehensive reviews that we received from the TPC members. We also had a specific best paper award review committee, uh, including Sudi Pesrecha from Colorado State University, Paul Gratz, Texas A&M, uh, &E and Hiroki uh, Matsutani from KU University. So as you probably have seen in the program, we had uh, two best paper award candidates. And uh, the first one, traversal packets, opportunistic bypass packets for dead luck recovery. Second one, RB OLEDs, a worst case three order buffer size reduction method for 3D um, NOC. So based on the comments that we received from uh, the committee and their, uh, their votes, uh, the best paper award this year goes to um, the traversal packets, opportunistic bypass packets for dead luck recovery by Ji Chang Chen, Rangyu Deng, Kun Zeng, Xiao Chiang Ni, and Hong Wei uh, Zhu. So congratulations! Um, I think uh, this is this is very well deserved. Um, the second candidate uh, will also receive a certificate to be the finalist and. The best paper award will also receive a certificate uh, showing the best paper award from from this year's uh, Knox. Um, just you know, to close the uh, close this year's NOC again, um, I think these are just some of the notes that I took from um, uh, among a lot of things that I uh, myself learned from attending this year. You know. Just a few things that I uh, thought, you know, I would list over here uh, from the first keynote um, given by Marilyn Wolf, I know how to design efficient IoT nodes. And then, you know, we heard uh, from uh, Bill this morning about these other comments and considerations for efficient NOCs. Um, and I think all the way to the wonderful panel that Rado put together um, discussing past, present and possible directions uh, of NOCs. 
So once again, uh, on behalf of the um, this year's organizing committee, um, I would like to thank you everyone for attending this year's conference. Um, again, I'm just talking on behalf of everyone. Um, this definitely was a team effort, and I'm just uh, I was lucky to be part of uh, this amazing team uh, this year. Uh, next year, um, ES Week is uh, with which NOC will uh, be co-located will be in Hamburg, Germany, um, October 23, and hopefully it's going to be in person, and we're going to get to uh, meet in person. And as Radu suggested, maybe we can find some good wine in in Germany, um, and then we can all drink together. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and um, I hope to see everyone next year. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.